a tragedy amongst my few friends at the high school i had at different times two who might be called intimate one of these friendships did not last long though i never forsook my friend he forsook me because i made friends with the other this latter friendship i regard as a tragedy in my life it lasted long i formed it in spirit of a reformer this companion was originally my elder brother friend they were classmate i knew his weakness but i regarded him as a faithful friend my mother my eldest brother and my wife warned me that i was in bad company i was too proud to heed my wife warning but i dared not go against the opinion of my mother and my eldest brother nevertheless i pleaded with them saying i know he has the weaknesses you attribute to him but you do not know his virtues he cannot lead me astray as my association with him is meant to reform him for i am sure that if he reforms his ways he will be a splendid man i beg you not to be anxious on my account i do not think this satisfied them but they accepted my explanation and let me go my way i have seen since that i had calculated wrongly a reformer cannot afford to have close intimacy with him whom he seeks to reform true friendship is an identity of souls really to be found in this world only between like natures can friendship be altogether worthy and enduring friends react on one another hence in friendship there is very little scope for reform i am of opinion that all exclusive intimacies are to be avoided for man takes in vice far more readily than virtue and he who would be friends with god must remain alone or make the whole world his friend i may be wrong but my effort to cultivate an intimate friendship proved a failure a wave of reform was sweeping over rajkot at the time when i first came across this friend he informed me that many of our teachers were secretly taking meat and wine he also named many well known people of rajkot as belonging to the same company there were also i was told some high school boys among them i was surprised and pained i asked my friend the reason and he explained it thus we are a weak people because we do not eat meat the english are able to rule over us because they are meat eaters you know how hardy i am and how great a runner too it is because i am a meat eater meat eaters do not have boils or tumors and even if they sometimes happen to have any these heal quickly our teachers and other distinguished people who eat meat are no fools they know its virtues you should do likewise there is nothing like trying try and see what strength it gives all these pleas on behalf of meat eating were not advance at a single sitting they represent the substance of a long and elaborate argument which my friend was trying to impress upon me from time to time my elder brother had already fallen he therefore supported my friend argument i certainly looked feeble bodied by the side of my brother and this friend they were both hardier physically stronger and more daring this friend exploits cast a spell over me he could run long distances and extraordinarily fast he was an adept in high and long jumping he could put up with any amount of corporal punishment he would often display his exploits to me and as one is always dazzled when he sees in others the qualities that he lacks himself i was dazzled by this friend exploits this was followed by a strong desire to be like him i could hardly jump or run why should not i also be as strong as he moreover i was a coward i used to be haunted by the fear of thieves ghosts and serpents i did not dare to stir out of doors at night darkness was a terror to me it was almost impossible for me to sleep in the dark as i would imagine ghosts coming from one direction thieves from another and serpents from a third 
I could not therefore bear to sleep without a light in the room. How could I disclose my fears to my wife? No child, but already at the threshold of youth, sleeping by my side, I knew that she had more courage than I, and I felt ashamed of myself. She knew no fear of serpents and ghosts. She could go out anywhere in the dark. My friend knew all these weaknesses of mine. He would tell me that he could hold in his hand live serpents, could defy thieves and did not believe in ghosts. And all this was, of course, the result of eating meat. A doggerel of the Gujarati poet Narmad was in vogue amongst us schoolboys. As follows, Behold the mighty Englishman he rules the Indian small. Because being a meat eater he is five cubits tall. All this had its due effect on me. I was beaten. It began to grow on me that meat eating was good. That it would make me strong and daring. And that, if the whole county took to meat eating, the English could be overcome. A day was thereupon fixed for beginning the experiment. It had to be conducted in secret. The Gandhis were Vavishnavas. My parents were particularly staunch Vavishnavas. They would regularly visit the Haveli. The family had even its own temples. Jainism was strong in Gujarat. And its influence was felt everywhere and on all occasions. The opposition to an abhorrence of meat-eating that existed in Gujarat among the Jains and Vavishnavas were to be seen nowhere else in India or outside in such strength. These were the traditions in which I was born and bred. And I was extremely devoted to my parents. I knew that the moment they came to know of my having eaten meat, they would be shocked to death. Moreover, my love of truth made me extra cautious. I cannot say that I did not know then that I should have to deceive my parents if I began eating meat. But my mind was bent on the reform. It was not a question of pleasing the palate. I did not know that it had a particularly good relish. I wished to be strong and daring and wanted my countrymen also to be such. So that we might defeat the English and make India free. The word Swaraj I had not yet heard. But I knew what freedom meant. The frenzy of the reform blinded me. And having ensured secrecy. I persuaded myself that mere hiding the deed from parents was no departure from truth. So the day came, it is difficult fully to describe my condition. There were, on the one hand, the zeal for reform, and the novelty of making a momentous departure in life. There was, on the other, the shame of hiding like a thief to do this very thing. I cannot say which of the two swayed me more. We went in search of a lonely spot by the river. And there I saw, for the first time in my life meat. There was baker bread also. I relished neither. The goat meat was as tough as leather. I simply could not eat it. I was sick and had to leave off eating. I had a very bad night afterwards. A horrible nightmare haunted me. Every time I dropped off to sleep it would seem as though a live goat were bleating inside me. And I would jump up full of remorse. But then I would remind myself that meat eating was a duty and so become more cheerful. My friend was not a man to give in easily. He now began to cook various delicacies with meat. And dress them neatly. And for dining. No longer was the secluded spot on the river chosen, but a state house, with its dining hall, and tables and chairs, about which my friend had made arrangements in collusion with the chief cook there. This bait had its effect. I got over my dislike for bread, forswore my compassion for the goats, and became a relisher of meat dishes, if not of meat itself. This went on for about a year. But not more than half a dozen meat feasts were enjoyed in all. Because the state house was not available every day. And there was the obvious difficulty about frequently preparing expensive savory meat dishes. 
I had no money to pay for this reform. My friend had therefore always to find the wherewithal. I had no knowledge where he found it. But find it he did. Because he was bent on turning me into a meat eater. But even his means must have been limited. And hence these feasts had necessarily to be few and far between. Whenever I had occasion to indulge in these surreptitious feasts, dinner at home was out of the question. My mother would naturally ask me to come and take my food and want to know the reason why I did not wish to eat. I would say to her, I have no appetite today. There is something wrong with my digestion. It was not without compunction that I devised these pretexts. I knew I was lying and lying to my mother. I also knew that, if my mother and father came to know of my having become a meat eater, they would be deeply shocked. This knowledge was gnawing at my heart. Therefore I said to myself, though it is essential to eat meat, and also essential to take up food, reform, in the country, yet deceiving and lying to one father and mother is worse than not eating meat in their lifetime. Therefore, meat eating must be out of the question. When they are no more and I have found my freedom, I will eat meat openly. But until that moment arrives I will abstain from it. This decision I communicated to my friend. And I have never since gone back to meat. My parents never knew that two of their sons had become meat eaters. I abjured meat out of the purity of my desire not to lie to my parents. But I did not abjure the company of my friend. My zeal for reforming him had proved disastrous for me. And all the time I was completely unconscious of the fact. The same company would have led me into faithlessness to my wife. But I was saved by the skin of my teeth. My friend once took me to a brothel. He sent me in with the necessary instructions. It was all prearranged. The bill had already been paid. I went into the jaws of sin. But God in his infinite mercy protected me against myself. I was almost struck blind and dumb in this den of vice. I sat near the woman on her bed. But I was tongue-tied. She naturally lost patience with me. And showed me the door. With abuses and insults, I then felt as though my manhood had been injured, and wished to sink into the ground for shame. But I have ever since given thanks to God for having saved me. I can recall four more similar incidents in my life, and in most of them my good fortune, rather than any effort on my part, saved me, from a strictly ethical point of view. All these occasions must be regarded as moral lapses, for the carnal desire was there, and it was as good as the act. But from the ordinary point of view, a man who is saved from physically committing sin is regarded as saved. And I was saved only in that sense. There are some actions from which an escape is a godsend both for the man who escapes and for those about him, man. As soon as he gets back his consciousness of right, is thankful to the divine mercy for the escape. As we know that a man often succumbs to temptation, however much he say resist it. We also know that providence often intercedes and saves him in spite of himself. How all this happens, how far a man is free and how far a creature of circumstances, how far. Free will comes into play and where fate enters on the scene all this is a mystery and will remain. A mystery. But to go on with the story. Even this was far from opening my eyes to the viciousness of my friend company. I therefore had many more bitter drafts in store for me. Until my eyes were actually opened by an ocular demonstration of some of his lapses quite. Unexpected by me. But of them later. As we are proceeding chronologically, one thing, however, I must mention now, as it pertains to the same period, one of the reasons of my differences with my wife was undoubtedly the company of this friend. 
I was both a devoted and a jealous husband, and this friend fanned the flame of my suspicions about my wife. I never could doubt his veracity, and I have never forgiven myself the violence of which I have been guilty in often having pained my wife by acting on his information. Perhaps only a Hindu wife would tolerate these hardships, and that is why I have regarded woman as an incarnation of tolerance. A servant wrongly suspected may throw up his job, a son in the same case may leave his father roof, and a friend may put an end to the friendship. A wife, if she suspects her husband, will keep quiet, but if her husband suspects her, she is ruined. Where is she to go? A Hindu wife may not seek divorce in a law court. Law has no remedy for her. And I can never forget or forgive myself for a having driven my wife to that desperation. The canker of suspicion was rooted out only when I understood ahimsa. Ahimsa means literally not hurting. Non-violence. In all its bearings, I saw then the glory of Brahmacharya. Brahmacharya means literally conduct that leads one to God. Its technical meaning is self-restraint, particularly mastery over the sexual organ, and realize that the wife is not the husband-born slave, but his companion and his helpmate, and an equal partner in all his joys and sorrows as free as the husband to choose her own path. Whenever I think of those dark days of doubts and suspicions, I am filled with loathing of my folly and my lustful cruelty. And I deplore my blind devotion to a friend.